Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. And uh, uh, thanks for joining uh, today's webinar about biosecurity and antimicrobial resistance mitigation. First of all, let's have a quick word about the translation. If you want to hear this webinar in Spanish, please click on the globe at the bottom of your screen and enable the translation. So welcome again. I am Marisabel Caballero, and I work as Global Technical Manager for Poultry with AW Nutrition. Today, it is my great pleasure to introduce two exceptional speakers. First, we have Dr. Manon Rasicot. She is a veterinary epidemiologist working as adjunct professor at the University of Montreal since 2015. Her research has focused on evaluating strategies to enhance biosecurity compliance and investigate its relationship with personality traits, education, and experience. She has worked for the Office of Animal Biosecurity at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, developing biosecurity standards at the farm level. Manon also is working in food safety, leading the development of risk assessment models for the food industry, feed mills, and renderers. She is involved in several biosecurity related national projects and is widely recognized for her innovative approaches to biosecurity challenges. In summary, our second presentation, which is in the hands of uh, El Manon, is in the hands of a speaker with a high level of practical and solution oriented expertise. Manon? Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, it, it will be a great pleasure to share my experience this, well, this morning for me, this afternoon for you, most of you, um, on biosecurity compliance. In charge of our first presentation, we have a Dr. Jerome de Wolf, professor at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine of the Ghent University in Belgium. His main research is in quantitative epidemiology and control of zoonosis with emphasis on antimicrobial use and resistance in animals, as well as on the prevention of epidemic and endemic diseases and the application of biosecurity measures. He is the head of the Veterinarian Epidemiology Unit and is supervising over 10 PhD students doing research in veterinary epidemiology and has so far co-authored more than 300 publications in that field. Jerome, is chair or member of different scientific committees and organizations in the topic of antimicrobial resistance. He's the principal author of the annual Belgium report on antimicrobial consumption in animals and has written two books about biosecurity and antimicrobial resistance. Jeroen. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, webinar. And I will really be delighted to share some of our research findings on, on biosecurity. Thank you. Uh, we also uh, have a, a, another panelist, Felipe Barbosa, who will support this webinar with both content and technical issues. Felipe is head of global technical management swine at EW Nutrition. Felipe. Thanks, Ms. Abel. Uh, thanks, Manon. Thanks, Jeroen. And hello, everybody. Thanks for being here with us. And I hope you enjoy these nice two presentations we have for you today. Together, we will help answer questions during and after the presentations. Your questions can be asked through the webinar in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Some of these questions will receive instant replies from us, and some of them will be picked up and answered in the live discussion that will follow the presentation. And now let's roll the first presentation with a Dr. Andrew DeWolf. The stage is yours. So thank you very much. If everything is right, you should be able to see my screen now. Okay, thank you. So uh, welcome once more. And uh, it is my pleasure to give a presentation on the impact of biosecurity on health and production uh, production results in food producing animals. So I'm coming from the Faculty of Veterinary Medicines at, uh, Medicine at Ghent University. 
So maybe let's start with, with giving a short definition of what is biosecurity, because the term biosecurity is used uh, all over the place. It's becoming even a, a little bit of a buzzword, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page and that we all understand each other well, uh, uh, look at the, the definition. What we consider as biosecurity is actually the combination of all measures taken to reduce, and I'll put on my laser pointer, all measures taken to reduce the risk of introduction and spread of infectious diseases at a farm level or maybe a region level, a country level or worldwide level. So we can look at biosecurity at different levels. In our research and in the results I'm gonna present you uh, this afternoon, I'm gonna focus mainly on biosecurity at the farm level and the effect of biosecurity implementation at the farm level. Uh, but you really can also look at it from, from different uh, angles. Huh? But it is, in any case, it's always about the measures taken to prevent uh, 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 the risk or to reduce the risk of introduction and spread of infectious uh, diseases. So from that point of view, biosecurity can easily be uh, separated into two different components. We have the external biosecurity, which are all measures that are taken to prevent the introduction of a pathogen in your farm. So it's actually trying to build a shield around your farm to avoid that external uh, pathogens come in. And this is typically the part of biosecurity which is best known uh, and, and often also already best applied. If there is anything in the legislation about biosecurity, it's, it's almost always referring also to this external biosecurity. Measures you can take or you can impose upon others to avoid uh, the pathogens come into your farm. It's of course a very important component of biosecurity, but it's not the only one. Right? And the second component is this internal biosecurity uh, which is often lesser well understood, lesser well applied in the field. And this is everything which has to do with spread of pathogens within your farm, right? from one age group to another, from one production uh, site to another production site. Right? And this part, uh, of course, is also very important and is becoming even more important since farms are, are, are growing. And the bigger your farm becomes, the more risk you have that also internally within the farm uh, pathogens will start to uh, spread. So biosecurity has these two components. And when we talk about biosecurity measures, we will really refer to both uh, components of biosecurity. So why should we implement biosecurity? Well, we do that with the aim to have lesser diseases. We want to avoid these infections. And we want to do infection prevention to have lesser disease and if you have more healthy animals, you have better production results uh, translated into reproduction, into growth, into feed conversion, uh, even uh, more uniform uh, production groups. If you have um, better health, uh, you also need lesser antimicrobials and you don't need the antibiotics. And if you use lesser antimicrobials, of course, you will also have lesser antimicrobial resistance right? because there is a clear link between the use of antibiotics and the development or the selection for resistant bacteria. And if you do that, you might even have be able to, to, to roll into some, some premium selling uh, uh, um, quality labels uh, where, where you could get better health or, or better uh, uh, sales prices for your animals. So also that is, is a possibility. Other reasons to have biosecurity is that it often fits into eradication programs. Uh, depending on the different countries. So you, you, some countries have eradication programs with salmonella, even influenza, African swine fever, uh, BVD and cattle. And there's plenty of uh, diseases in animals that we try to control or even try to eradicate. In all of these eradication programs, biosecurity will be an important component. And then we have this risk of these exotic diseases. In some part of the world, uh, uh, not to say at the least in Europe, uh, some time ago, we thought that's over and done with. Uh, we've dealt with foot and mouth disease. We've dealt with the uh, uh, classical swine fever. Uh, we're good at it. And, and it's, it's something from the past. Uh, but reality these days shows us that epidemic diseases, both in humans and in animals, are nothing, not at all from the past. They are the real reality today. And they likely will be uh, remain the reality also in the future. Uh, for existing pathogens, but also new pathogens that may uh, come in. 
And so also therefore to, to, to prevent ourselves against these exotic diseases, we should have good biosecurity. And then of course, there's this public health, animal welfare, public opinion. Uh, we need to have a, a, more and more, we need a license to produce. Uh, the, the public opinion uh, is critical about, about producing animals. And if we do it, uh, if we do it in, a, in an unsustainable way, it can, it's only going to become more critical. And then finally, I referred to it already before. Uh, sometimes biosecurity measures are also mentioned in the legislation. There is a legislative reason uh, to, to include them. Okay, so many reasons why we have to include biosecurity. But if you look at all of these, yeah, and especially here with production and antimicrobial usage and so on, you may wonder, well, or at least that's what I did some 10 years ago when we started studying biosecurity. Everybody are, is claiming these associations, but are they really there? Has somebody shown them? Has somebody proof, proven that better biosecurity truly results in better production or in lesser antimicrobial usage? And actually, in the past, the answer was no. Uh, we believed it was like this, but, but there was very little quantitative data supporters. Fortunately, today uh, we have a lot of research has been done uh, in, in my group, but also in other groups. And more and more, we start to see the evidence that there is truly a link. And that is what I'm, I'm going to show you. Uh, but before doing that, or to allow us to, to, to study these associations between better biosecurity and improved production or improved health, we need to be able to measure biosecurity. And to be able to do so, we developed this biocheck system, which is a, an, an online available, totally for free. So everybody can go to the system and use it. And it's a risk-based scoring tool to quantify biosecurity, either for pigs, for poultry, or for cattle. And we have the different systems available in different uh, languages. And, and you can fill in the questionnaire. And after having filled in the questionnaire, you get a scoring report. You get this type of reports showing you the result of your farm compared to a country average and a world average. It allows you also to, to benchmark your outcome towards other outcomes. But even more important, uh, you can measure and can benchmark, but based on this, uh, you can also improve and you can use this as a starting point for counseling. And so it's not only about doing the questionnaire and quantifying, but it's also about then using this as an audit tool to start to improve, to start to, to make changes on your farm. And, and that's the role for, for veterinarians, for, for advisors uh, of, of different backgrounds that can help the farmer with improving the biosecurity on his or her farm. And in this report, you see uh, the red numbers are the numbers scoring a, a little bit lower. So you immediately also can see where you need to make uh, changes, where you can make improvements. Mm -hmm. And so that is, how we measure the biosecurity. So coming to the results of our studies. So the first study I'm gonna to present to you is a, was a big cross-sectional study already performed almost 10 years ago, and where we looked at pig farms and, and we quantified the biosecurity with the biocheck, and then we looked at different production outcomes. And first thing we saw is that farms that have better external and internal biosecurity, they also turned out to have better higher daily weight gains. And you see this positive uh, association here. We also found that farms that have better biosecurity have lower feed conversion ratios, which is again, a positive association actually, and because the, the lower your feed conversion, the more efficient your production is. So again, we find a, a positive or good association with our biosecurity. Uh, looking at our antimicrobial usage, which is quantified here as a treatment incident. So it's a number of treatment days. Uh, here again, we see that there is a negative association. And uh, my line is going down, showing me that if I have higher biosecurity uh, values, I have lower levels of antimicrobial usage. At the same time, you see, and the critical uh, listener has already thought about it, you see that not all my dots are lying exactly on this line. There is a lot of variation. Right? And that's a point I want to make very clear also. Uh, biosecurity is a component of healthy animal production. It's not the only thing. Yeah? Uh, producing healthy animals is also about housing. It's about feeding. It's about the genetics of the animals. It's about the stockmanship of the farmer. 
So there's a lot of components that are playing a role, but also biosecurity bi contributes to it uh, in the sense that if your biosecurity is better, uh, you have, uh, uh, you, it is associated with lower levels of antimicrobial uh, usage. In my second study, uh, we did again a cross-sectional study on more farms, and here we did it in four different uh, countries. And again, uh, we've, we found uh, uh, very nice associations. Uh, first of all, we found that the internal and the external biosecurity are associated with each other, meaning that if you have a high bi external biosecurity, you typically also have a high internal biosecurity. This really illustrates that biosecurity is, is a kind of an attitude, and Manon will talk about it later as well. It's really an attitude to the farmer, and if you do one component good, you're very likely that you will also do the second component uh, are good. So that's a, a positive association. We also see that farms that do good biosecurity often have also good vaccination protocols. Uh, we see that bigger farms, uh, translated here in the number of employees, have better biosecurity. And that's important also because the bigger your farm becomes, the more risks you run. And therefore, you need to have a better biosecurity. And then again, the link to the production. Here in this study, we found that better biosecurity is translated in a higher number of lean piglets per sow per year. And so again, a, a positive association between uh, production and biosecurity. But then there is a lot of other things coming in here. And this is what we call a causal web. And you see that many things are associated with each other. And so, and, and that is, it's important to understand that producing animals and, and and achieving good health is really a multifactorial issue. You have to take into account many different components of which, again, a biosecurity is a, is a central uh, uh, contributor to good health. Uh, okay, what, what else did we found in this study? We also looked at the antimicrobial usage and we found that antimicrobial usage in the different age categories is also uh, strongly associated. Uh, which is easy, right, rather logical to understand that if you have high usage in your, in your growers, uh, uh, then you likely also have high usage in your breeders. Uh, sometimes people say, well, if we can treat a lot of antibiotics in the beginning, we don't need them so much uh, at the end of the production. Uh, several uh, studies have already shown that that is not true. Right? If you use a lot of antibiotics in the beginning of the production, you're likely to gonna be use a lot of antibiotics throughout the full production. Uh, cycle. Um, but again, here uh, we, we found that the, that this antimicrobial usage is influenced by many different things, so the firing rhythm, the, 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 the vaccination schemes, but also about external biosecurity again. So again, also here we found the link between biosecurity uh, uh, and antimicrobial usage. Also the weaning age, if you wean your piglets too early at the too young age, and you, you will get a higher antimicrobial usage. So again, there is other components playing a role. The next study, we looked at the top farmers. Now, what are top farmers? Well, those are the farmers that are uh, uh, achieving to get high productivity. This is the number of weaned pigs per sow per year combined with low antimicrobial usage. And so this, this upper left quadrant, uh, which is uh, the best group, uh, they have high product productivity and use little antimicrobials. And then we looked at their characteristics, to what extent they differ from the others. Well, if you look at it again, that is biosecurity comes back. On average, higher internal biosecurity status was found on these farms. Besides that, uh, they, these farms were the, the region where you grow your pigs, uh, the intensity of your region is also a, an influence. And then also uh, uh, there was a strong link to respiratory diseases which are often also associated with the climate and the stable set, the, the, uh, the, 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 the yeah. quality of the air, the animals are breeding, is also influencing here uh, uh, the, the outcome. Okay, maybe just make a, a short a pause here. So I've shown you already three studies that clearly show that there is an association between biosecurity and production results or between biosecurity and antimicrobial usage. But be careful. What I've shown you until now are only associations. I have not talked about causal relationships. 
based on these previous studies, I cannot conclude what is the cause and what is the result. Is it due to the good biosecurity that we have le uh, lesser antimicrobial usage? Or is this maybe only a coincidental association that we find? Or there is something else playing in the background? It's from a biological point of view, we can think it's likely that it's due to the biosecurity, but we, we're not 100% sure in, these, uh, in, the, in the studies that I've shown. To be able to be more sure about this causal association relationship, we did some intervention studies, uh, studies where we really go in and do make some changes uh, and see what happens after we made some changes. And to do this, and uh, we did an intervention study on 61 uh, pig farms again in Belgium, uh, where we coached the farms towards better, uh, towards, uh, better biosecurity and then also looked at what happened with the antimicrobial uh, usage. We coached, coached them about different components of biosecurity as, as yeah, the advices that are required are different in every farm, really farm dependent. Uh, and, and when we did that, we really could achieve in, in less than one year time, we could achieve high improvements. Uh, we could uh, uh, improve the biosecurity on average with 12%. And then especially uh, we, we made good progress on the internal biosecurity. Remember, that's the component where you avoid spread of diseases between age groups, between compartments. And that's also the component of the biosecurity, which is often lesser well implemented. So we made good, uh, good uh, improvements on the biosecurity. And then we look at the uh, uh, effect on the antimicrobial usage. And within more or less one year time, uh, we could reduce the antimicrobial usage in the uh, piglets with almost 46% and the finishers with almost 82%. And if we combine both, uh, those two together, uh, we had a reduction with the uh, pigs from birth to slaughter uh, with more than 50%. Uh, so in less than one year time, we could halve the amount of antimicrobials that were used. And we could also see that in the sows, uh, we had a reduction of around uh, 40, uh, almost uh, uh, 32%. Uh, so also there, we saw a very uh, important uh, reduction in the usage. And what is even more important is that the, all of this was combined with an improved productivity. And the number of weaned piglets per sow per year went up in the same period. The daily weight gain went up and the mortality went down. And so lesser antimicrobials used and still lesser uh, 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 dead pigs. And that's, why, that's because we've replaced the antibiotics by better infection prevention, by better uh, biosecurity. My fifth study is actually a, a very comparable study where we've done uh, the same types of interventions, but this time we did it on, on broiler farms. Eh? And also here, uh, you see that we could improve the biosecurity on these uh, broiler farms, uh, and uh, we could reduce uh, the antimicrobial usage while maintaining or even improving the production results in, in that period. Huh? So here we reduced the antimicrobial usage uh, with almost 30%. This was a smaller study. Uh, so if we, we do this in bigger uh, numbers of farms, we believe actually, and over a longer period of time, we believe actually that we can achieve even better results than uh, this. So, I've now shown you that there is associations and if you intervene, you can achieve a good progress. Uh, so I think we've, yeah, we have quite some proof that there are some links. Uh, and then the next step is to see whether there is an economic, uh, is there, what, what is the economic consequence of doing all of this? Uh, is improving biosecurity, is that actually economically uh, uh, valid to do so? Well, uh, in, uh, in this study, we've looked at the uh, improvements of biosecurity on a, on a pig farm, on an average pig farm, and it turns out that that was a cost of around four year, euros per sow per year, and that would be $4 uh, per sow per year. And there is a certain cost. It's not extremely high, but there is a certain cost related to uh, biosecurity measures uh, to take. On the vaccination, we had not that big uh, changes. Uh, uh, because on those farms that we coached towards improved uh, biosecurity, we, we often did not advise to add many vaccines. So we sometimes advise to improve the vaccination, change your vaccination scheme, maybe remove one vaccine and replace it by another. 
But whenever you really add a lot of vaccines and the prices uh, go up, that's for sure. And then in terms of reducing your antimicrobial usage here, you gain a lot, right? because if you don't use the antibiotics, you don't have to buy them. And there you can avoid a, a certain cost. Bringing all this together in combination with your improved uh, productivity. And so it's not only uh, the, the additional cost and the avoided cost, but it's also the improved uh, um, productivity. It turned out that in this study, uh, it, uh, improving biosecurity uh, resulted in a, in a net positive benefit of around 43 euros per cell per year and around uh, 2.7 uh, euros per finisher per year. Uh, so really, uh, and that's important that the wording is here is important. I really look at improving biosecurity as investments. They are not costs. They cost something in the beginning, but it's really a, a cost that is paid back later on. And therefore, and you should look at, at improving biosecurity in terms of investments and not in terms of uh, costs. So we've done the study again, uh, just to make sure that this was not a coincidental uh, uh, outcome. And we've done it again, again on, on multiple countries. And here again, uh, we, found, uh, we found a positive uh, association of around uh, four euros per cell per year. And in France, it was 1.2 euros per cell per year. These are not the, the really big numbers. It doesn't mean that if you improve your biosecurity, uh, your, your, your profitability is gonna, it's gonna uh, go sky high, but it does show you that improving biosecurity brings you money and it doesn't cost you money. And at the same time, it improves animal health and human health uh, because you can reduce the antimicrobial usage and therefore you can reduce antimicrobial resistance in animals and in humans. One last thing I want to say about this uh, slide is that uh, on average, we have good improvements of, of uh, uh, good economic benefits. Sometimes the economic uh, result is negative. And so be aware of that, uh, be, be careful with averages. On average, it's, po it's positive. Sometimes it's negative, meaning again, what I said already before, biosecurity is not the only thing on your farm to improve. Right? You have also have to think about other things and it's not only by improving biosecurity that you can solve every issue uh, on the farm. So concluding, uh, I really think uh, that biosecurity is, or it should be at least, uh, the basis of any disease control program. If you want to build a nice house, if you want to build strong and good animal health production systems, you need to have a, a solid fundament. And this fundament is really the biosecurity. Uh, based upon this fundament, you can build with, with preventive measures. Uh, those are the typical the vaccines, of course, but also uh, food additives, feed additives, water additives, uh, uh, all those things that you can use to uh, enhance the resilience of the animals uh, are all preventive tools that you have, and more and more we have them. And if we use those two uh, right, we can limit the need for, uh, for treatments, uh, the limit the need for antibiotics or other treatments. Because we always have to remember that if we have to treat an animal uh, after it was in, uh, diseased, we already failed once. Uh, our primary goal should be to keep healthy animals healthy. So I think I've, I hope I have shown you some data that might uh, uh, convince you that indeed higher biosecurity, improved biosecurity, and higher biosecurity can be helpful to reduce uh, uh, the antimicrobial usage. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention. If you want to know more about all of this, uh, we've written some, some books about it that are still available. Uh, and and if, you, if you want to get into contact, uh, these are my uh, contact details. And I'm very welcome you all your questions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Jeroen. A very, very good presentation. A lot of very interesting data and uh, a lot to highlight in while Manon, you were, while you were preparing your presentation, I just want to highlight here that Jeroen mentioned very clearly that biosecurity is a part of a much more complex strategy, right? And one tool that we are having at this moment is actually biocheck. So biocheck is a very useful tool that Jeroen is using for his studies as well. And we here at Islam Nutrition, we are, we are also working with biocheck. So if the audience is uh, interested on also discussing biocheck with us and with Jeroen, please feel free to get in touch with us and we're gonna help you with that. Manon, 
everything ready for you. We can start now. Excellent. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. All good? Excellent. Okay, so hi, everybody. Um, I, I hope now that you're convinced that biosecurity is important. And now we'll be talking about how to maintain biosecurity compliance by creating a biosecurity culture. So we have seen in the previous presentation several examples of how biosecurity measures can help um, preventing, controlling diseases. And you're seeing other examples now on the screen with uh, the lack of biosecurity measures increasing significantly different outcomes such as avian influenza, campylobacter, uh, salmonella, and, and others. These are only few, a few examples. And we have shown as well that higher use of antimicrobials was also as associated with the lack of biosecurity um, measures. So it's clear that biosecurity is part of the solution. So we need to uh, make sure that those basic pre prevention, uh, basic measures are implemented and, and maintained. We have done research in the past few years uh, using hidden cameras because we wanted to see if those basic measures were applied on poultry farms. So we have um, hidden cameras in the barn entrance so we could monitor what people were doing when getting in and out of a, of a barn. So what you can see on, on the graph is the compliance level of the different biosecurity measures. So for example, 52% of compliance for boots. So people were not all, always changing boots when getting in the barn. Uh, respecting the different areas, we'll come back to that aspect in the next few slides. Hand washing was also low as well. So the overall compliance was about 35%, which is quite low. Not very surprising because uh, we're seeing similar results in other uh, professionals, uh, such as healthcare professionals with hand washing in hospitals. But at least there, it's clear that there's place for improvement. So why people are not complying? So typically we would see in the literature that people uh, do have a lack of understanding and knowledge. They don't have time, money or equipment. Uh, they're not trained, communication is lacking, incentives is missing, uh, lack of consistency in recommended practices. And of course, there's all the component about the human nature and the impact of beliefs, attitudes, perception, education, and so on. So I'll be presenting over the next few slides other um, reasons why people are not complying and what we can do about it. So we're really trying to, um, to, to focus on the potential solutions. So all these reasons why people are not complying is really creating confusion and um, producers are having a hard time prioritizing what should be implemented. And this is increasing the likelihood of taking shortcuts. And by shortcuts, this picture is, is, is pretty clear. Um, when people are facing a barrier, uh, they might take uh, a shortcut to avoid uh, the situation. So biosecurity is, is really about a behavior. And this is why we need to implement a behavior-based system that would take into consideration different components to create your biosecurity culture. And all these components are connected together. So you can't only work on one specific aspect. You need to address all of them to make sure that you will create your biosecurity culture. So I'll be giving examples on how to have an effective work setup, how people might be influencing your biosecurity culture, what type of guidance we should be providing to those employees. And of course, the communication part, which is, is really important in terms of setting expectations and measure them. So let's start with the work setup. So what you're seeing now is a typical barn entrance design in the poultry industry in North America. So you can see here the outside door. You have a first area here where uh, we call it dirty area or the contaminated area. You have the logbook, you can put on your clothes there. And what we, we expect by moving over that red line on the floor, which can be a bench or a door, you're expecting to change your boots, to don new farm boots, wash your hands, and put on coveralls. So in the shrine industry, we would typically see a bench or two benches because sometimes they're using the Danish entrance. 
But in the poultry industry, most of the uh, producers would be using that red line. So what we're trying to do to set up an effective work setup is really to create that automatic behavior sequence in the sense that we need to perform the same action in the same order all the time. So people are, are, are typically doing the same behavior over and over. And we've, we've seen that with um, dairy producers when they're milking cows, they would be repeating the same actions over and over. So what we're trying to do here is change the work setup to make sure that people would be behaving the way we want them to behave. So here an example of three different barn entrance design. So you can see that this one, the first one is, we qualified that as being difficult to comply with because you have a very small area, you have the stairs going to the second floor, um, and you can imagine the employee going to the second floor and going over that contaminated area even though uh, the person is wearing farm boots. And when you're getting in that barn two person at a time, it's very difficult to comply because you don't have enough space. The second example, uh, you have a very large contaminated area. The outside door is here. You have the logbook here and all the measures you need to implement. But the, the bizarre thing here is that the birds are, would be on this side and you can see the chair here. So this is where the employee would be uh, sitting during the day, uh, compiling results and so on. But you can imagine that every time the person would go see the birds, he or she would need to go across the red line to go see the birds. So because of human nature, people tend to, to take shortcuts. So of course the employee was going over that contaminated area all the time. The last example is, is um, a barn entrance design that was, was qualified as being easy to comply with. You have the outside door, you have a large area where you can be more than one person at a time, you have a clear delimitation where you need to change your boots and, and move on. So of course, when you have an effective work setup, it, it will be increasing your chances of complying by 13 times. This is what we have shown with using hidden cameras. So it's, it's important to make sure that you're providing the work setup that would improve compliance. Another example would be uh, the type of delimitation. So we did compare a red line compared to a physical barrier such as a bench or a door. So again, as you might be expecting, the chances of complying with those areas and changing your boots is, is better with the physical barrier. It's, it, it reminds people that they need to do something while going over that bench. So these are very simple examples where we uh, could be providing a better workspace for uh, employees in order to um, perform better the, the expected biosecurity measures. So moving on to people. So of course, human nature is quite complex. I'm gonna give you uh, only two examples of the research we have done in that area where we evaluated, for example, the relationship between personality traits and compliance. So we have seen in other fields that uh, personality traits were good predictor of certain behavior. So we wanted to investigate if it was the case as well with biosecurity compliance. And we found out that there were three personality traits that were significantly associated with compliance. The first one is responsibility. So the, the more you score high on the responsibility trade, uh, personality trait, the more you would be compliant with biosecurity measures. So someone who would be responsible, it, it, the, the person would not do compromise or bend the rules. Same thing for action oriented. So these people would be reacting quickly to constraints of the environment, which is a good thing because uh, you have seen that sometimes it's difficult to comply with uh, the workspace. And the last personality traits was complexity. So this would be someone who values um, logical, rational approach and use complex strategies. So again, all these personality traits were significantly associated with uh, biosecurity compliance. This is, so this is good information when it comes to selecting, selecting farm employees, if you do have the luxury of selecting uh, those employees, but at least it should be used for selecting the managers that should lead by example. So a manager with a high compliance would be positively influencing their coworkers. So we need to uh, showcase biosecurity and um, make sure it is uh, shown by 
by mo the most people possible. Another example in the human nature component, um, we have completed a research project in France uh, with the duck industry um, that was dealing with avian influenza outbreaks. So we wanted to investigate using questionnaire and on-site visit if people were adopting the biosecurity, the recommended biosecurity measures. So we have found that there were three different clusters of farmers. The first one uh, was having a low adoption of biosecurity measures. And the second and the third were having high adoption. And when we look into the social psychological aspect, we found out that the cluster one with low adoption was having minimal knowledge, negative attitudes towards biosecurity, low social pressure, and low conscientiousness, which is a personality trait that we have seen in the previous slide. For the second cluster, we have found that um, those producers had this, an extensive experience, high stress and high social pressure. So they were uh, adopting more biosecurity measures because of those uh, parameters. And the last cluster had low experience. However, they had good knowledge, positive attitudes toward biosecurity, high self-confidence and action oriented, which, which is also a personality trait we have seen in the previous study that was associated with compliance. So this type of information is very important to understand why people are not complying and where we should be addressing uh, the gaps. So changing the attitudes by providing guidance, clear guidance to those people would be helpful. So let's move on to the guidance part. The guidance part would be including education and training. And there's a, a difference between both. So education would be related to why we're doing biosecurity, when we need to do it, who needs to do it. While the training would be really the hands-on, how to do things. And we can't neglect that this is highly important and we're not doing enough efforts in that component, showing people how to behave. And based on social uh, sciences, it was shown that error-based training was significantly improving judgment and adaptive thinking. So people were performing well and better when they had error-based training because they learn what not to do so they can have better understanding of, of what to do. So this is quite interesting because we have described in the past different biosecurity mistakes that were done when entering and exiting poultry farms based on video surveillance. So we have a very good understanding of what people are, are not doing properly. But we were wondering what was the impact of those biosecurity mistakes. So what we have done, we designed a, a research project that uh, simulated those biosecurity mistakes, but we did it in a way that we would be able to visualize contamination. So we used a genetically modified uh, pathogen um, and simulated those biosecurity mistakes to evaluate floor contamination as well as booth contamination. So basically we would get in the barn with contaminated boots. You have the red line here where you should be changing your boots and we will be sampling on the floor for each step. And then we will be sampling the booth at the end of the scenario. So the first mistake we have looked at would be donning boots in the clean area. So basically the person would get in the barn with contaminated boots, would cross over the red line and then don the farm boots or the plastic boots. So you can see that the contamination in the clean area is, is, is clear, uh, just, uh, just um, near the uh, red line. And then you have a, a, significantly, uh, reduc a significant reduction of the contamination on the floor, but you still have contamination that can create cross-contamination with other movement within the farm. And at the end of the scenario, the boots were contaminated. The second mistake we have done is donning boots in the dirty area, so in the contaminated area. So you would get in the barn with contaminated boots, so you can see the contamination here, and then you would be changing the boots in that area before moving into the clean area. And you can see that again, the contamination is quite stable over uh, the floor, and at the end of the scenario, you still have a lot of contamination in your boots. Not changing your boots was often seen during this uh, video surveillance. So you can see that when you're getting in the barn with contaminated boots and 
moving over the red line and walking in the clean area, there's no dilution effect of the contamination. Contamination is quite stable over time, which was quite interesting. We were expecting contamination to decrease with, by walking, but it was not the case. And at the end of the scenario, the boots are still quite contaminated. So the only way to present floor and boot contamination would be to, um, to, to change your boots while respecting the different areas. So here you can see that if you're getting in the barn with dirty boots and you're changing your boots while respecting the integrity of those two different areas, you don't have any contamination on the floor and you don't have any contamination on the boots. So we think that providing those visual would be helpful for, for employees to understand why they need to implement those biosecurity measures, why it's important. And um, because they cannot vis visualize the contamination usually. So by having this type of image uh, would be helpful. And the training is also quite important. And as we have shown, error must be learned from. So this type of, of research project would be quite useful for both components. So moving on to the last component, which is communication. So it's very important to um, set up your expectations and to have ways to, measures, to measure your achievement. So typically we would be uh, using a questionnaire to eva evaluate biosecurity. So it's a low cost, low time. It might somewhat reflect compliance. It all depends on how you're um, designing your questionnaire, what the type of question you're asking and who's responding to the questionnaire. For example, if you're asking an employee, are you changing your boots every time you're getting into the barn? Well, of course, the employee will most likely respond, yes, I'm doing it all the time because the person knows that they need to do it. So you might, um, it might not always reflect compliance. It might not also be a training opportunity depending on how you're using it. So we have seen in the previous presentation that the training and the monitoring aspect it was well used because you're providing feedback and comparing your uh, score with other scores, which is a very good thing to do uh, in terms of uh, motivation and uh, identifying or putting in place the, the social pressure that you need to, uh, to implement to have a change in your behavior. It's quite difficult, however, to have the continuous monitoring. You can also use audit. So audit would take a little bit more time, more costly. It might somewhat reflect compliance while you're doing the audit, but once you're not on the farm, who knows what's happening? It is a training opportunity because you can um, correct the mistakes you're seeing while you're doing your audit, but it's very hard to do continuous monitoring. The last um, method that is typically used would be cameras. This is what we have done in previous research projects. It is quite cheap to use cameras. However, the time involvement is pretty significant. It is a good reflection of compliance. You have a training opportunity because you can use those videos to provide feedback to employees. But continuous monitoring is, is very difficult. Um, there are nowadays uh, companies in the US offering the service to swine farms to do this, this continuous monitoring and to provide feedback uh, within 24 hours to, um, to the owner on how biosecurity was applied on, on his or her farm. So this is, is quite interesting, but as you can imagine, um, the cost is pretty significant. So what we have uh, seen in the literature is that frequent feedback was the best intervention to maintain compliance of healthcare professionals. So this is typically what is being used in hospital context to maintain hand washing compliance, for example. So we looked into the literature to see what could be the uh, way to measure uh, compliance in order to be able to provide that frequent feedback. So we have found that there was an RFID system that was used in hospital context to monitor hand washing compliance. And we adapted that system uh, for an on-farm pilot project in order to uh, monitor boot and hand sanitizing compliance when entering and exiting barns. So the system is quite simple. You have a chip into personal shoes. You have another chip into um, the farm boots. You have the antenna on the floor in the clean area connected to the hand sanitizer. 
and also connected to uh, a small computer that is able to provide an instant feedback and alarm when you're doing a biosecurity mistake. So you can correct your behavior or not. So basically when the system or the antenna is det detecting the personal shoes in the clean area, that would be re recorded as a biosecurity mistake. Same thing when you're detecting the farm boots without using the hand sanitizer, that would be uh, that would be recorded as a biosecurity mistake. We also asked the employees who participated to that project if they were appreciating the system because it was quite important to, for acceptability. So let's see some pictures of the system that we have used. It's still a prototype. Um, it is uh, used in hospitals, so it's not really adapted yet for the farm context, but we're working on it. So you have the antenna on the floor, you have the employee getting in the barn, you have the red line here where you're, you need to change your boots. And then the ship would be inserted into uh, the farm boots and you can seal that so uh, you don't have to change it. You can wash and disinfect your boots without any problem. So the ship into the farm boots would be detected by the RFID system on the floor. And while you're on the antenna, the system would be recording if you're using the hand sanitizer. So we have um, uh, placed the system on two farms. Uh, three to four employees were recorded by farm and five to 15 records were, um, were recorded by day. So what you're seeing on the graph would be uh, boot compliance compared to hand sanitizing compliance. And we, in the blue, uh, the blue bar would be representing the best, the baseline, which are the results from the previous study I have shown using video surveillance. So you can see that compliance was about 50% for boot compliance and 30% for sanit and sanitizing. On the first farm, you can see a significant increase in uh, boot compliance and in hand uh, sanitizing compliance, as well as the third farm, the second farm, where you have almost, well, you have perfect compliance for boots and a very good compliance for hand sanitizing as well. So you can see that um, it, the system is, is able to monitor uh, compliance and the system is also able to provide feedback to those employees and is able to record if the behavior was corrected. So we have looked into the about 100 non-compliant hand sanitizing events, and we have seen that 28% of those biosecurity mistakes were corrected after hearing the alarm. So this is quite interesting um, in terms of, of behavior, people would be correcting themselves. So we're gonna be adapting that system to make it farm proof. Um, the plan is would be to uh, test the new system uh, next summer. And of course, we'll be expanding um, the duration of the, the, the follow-ups so, so we can have a longer period of time and see what would be the effect of instant feedback compared to weekly feedback, for example. So these would be the topics of our next projects. In terms of accept acceptability, uh, the system was well received by farm employees. Uh, they thought that the biosecurity routine was easy to perform, it was relevant to evaluate compliance, and having that alarm system was relevant as well. Uh, they thought that the experience improved their daily compliance, and on the larger scale, it would also improve biosecurity compliance. Uh, employees were not bothered by wearing ship's shoes. They, they understood very well that this was not a GPS, it was only to detect the boots uh, that were uh, done on the farm and wearing ship shoes, uh, they did not find it intrusive to their personal life. So I think this is quite a promising system uh, to look at in the future. So in conclusions, uh, I think it's pretty clear that biosecurity measures are the cornerstone for fighting infectious diseases. And we can do something to increase compliance. And this would be uh, through implementing a behavior-based system so what I've presented by, might look simple, but it's highly important. And as it was mentioned in the previ previous presentation, that's the foundation of successful biosecurity plans. And by uh, addressing the different components of that behavior-based system, you will create your biosecurity culture. So all those collective efforts in controlling infectious disease will have a positive impact for both animal and public health. So with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators on those projects with the financial support. 
I'm giving you my contact information if you do have further questions, and it will be a pleasure to uh, answer your questions during the Q&A session. Thank you very much uh, to both speakers for uh, such interesting and complimentary presentations. We will now start uh, with some of the questions that were received uh, during the last uh, couple of weeks uh, in our email webinar at ewnutrition.com. Great, thanks Marcelo and uh, thanks Mano for the presentation. Um, the first question that we received is uh, aligned with what you mentioned already during your presentation, uh, Jeroen, but I would like also to hear from, again, from you and also from Manon, which is related to antibiotics. So which proportion of antibiotics can be reduced with higher biosecurity in our farms? Uh, it's, a, it's a very good question, but it's a difficult one to answer in terms of really giving an exact number. Uh, the amount of antimicrobials or antimicrobial usage you can reduce will highly depend on, on the level where you start from. And if, you're, if you are really in a, in, in a situation of farming practices where a lot of antimicrobials are used, you can reduce drastically. If you are, are already in a situation where you are using antimicrobials very sparsely and very limitedly, then yeah, it's going to be difficult to, to further go down. But, but anyway, I, I think I've shown you with some of my studies that are some of our studies that we really can, can go down substantially. We achieved 50% reductions in, in less than one year time in production and in, in pig production systems. And, and, and that is not, um, that's, that was not the one shot, uh, a lucky shot. And so I really think that is feasible in, in different conditions and moreover, uh, after we've conducted that study at the whole of our country in Belgium, we have reduced the total antimicrobial usage already with 40%, and other countries have done comparable things. So, so it also works at, at country level, uh, showing that it really is uh, feasible. So, it, but then last thing, it biosecurity, as I mentioned, contributes to reduction, but it's not only through biosecurity that you will achieve it. So you will also have to think about other components there. Manon, you yeah, want to I, add to that? Yeah, I fully agree with what was just mentioned. Um, I would like to add that uh, there's a collective effort that can be done as well. So you can have regulation that can help you reduce the antimicro antimicrobial use, as well as uh, high standards in the industry. So in, in Canada, uh, the industry decided to go beyond regulation and to ask their producers to reduce uh, to a certain level of antimicrobial uh, use over time. So improving and putting in place high standards uh, is, is I think the way to go as well. And this is, this is very much aligned with what we have seen during the both presentations then, because we saw also that, and Jeroen, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's not only on the part of the production that we use the most antibiotics. You show a number in your, in your studies in Belgium that you reduce with the weaning piglets that are well known as the number one usage of antibiotic in pig production, but you also reduce in sows and growing finishing pigs. Of course, it depends on the amount, but you can reduce it overall, right? So yeah, I, I, I agree with that. But Isabel. Yes, uh, uh, I wanted to comment uh, that uh, with such uh, good results uh, that uh, an improved biosecurity can give, then I think one of the most important things is incentivating, incentivating farm personnel to comply with biosecurity measures. So do you have any advice on that, Manon? Yes, well, in addition to what was mentioned during the presentation, um, we did not touch base on recognition. Mm -hmm. So recognition is very important to maintain motivation. And I think we should be uh, providing more uh, positive uh, recognition to employees based on their performance. So you need to be able to measure those performance, but as well to provide that feedback mechanism that will be helpful. The other part of the, the, the uh, answer would be related to involving farm personnel into designing biosecurity plan. So this is very important because you have a communication opportunity, training opportunity, and you can identify with farm employees what are their constraints and address them right away. So if you're identifying constraint that would uh, jeopardize your biosecurity compliance, you should be changing or adapting it to uh, and implementing new measures that would fit uh, the employee's needs as well as 
the, um, the prevention aspect, of course. So we have done, for example, studies with uh, catching crew members where we were uh, evaluating different protocols for washing their hands. As you can imagine, their hands are heavily contaminated by catching birds all overnight. So um, we tested different protocols, but we also asked them what was the most practical one for them. Um, and what we found out is that washing hands with water and soap was um, equivalent to hand sanitizing but they were preferring to use hot water and soap, which is not always available on farms. So we need to keep that in mind that uh, if we want people to comply with our recommendations, we should be uh, also looking into what would be their preference um, so they can have a good attitude toward the uh, behavior we're asking them to do. Great, thanks Manon. We have, of course, as, as you can imagine, we had we had several questions uh, arriving at our email was asking about the economics. Uh, how much does it cost? How to calculate that? Yeah, don't you have showed that during your presentation? So can you explain that a little bit more for us? How to make an economic evaluation of your biosecurity protocols and your biosecurity strategies in the farm level? Yeah, well, it's it, that is not such an easy task. So it, it took us also a bit of work, or I would say a lot of work, uh, to come up with these uh, publications and to, to, to do these calculations. Uh, it has two components. Eh? It has one side, it is calculating the costs. And that, I would say, is rather, it's the, the easy part, is to, to measure uh, the costs related to additional cleaning and disinfection or additional time you need to spend to do a number of... Uh, uh, of manipulations or buying boots and, and food and, and uh, additional clothes, things like that. Maybe even change your uh, stocking density. Those are the costs. On the cost side, it's quite easy to, to calculate. But the difficult part is that uh, your gains uh, to, to, to look at the benefit side and the benefit is related to reduced antimicrobial usage, is related to improve production results and that is more a long-term effect. So one, one thing I would say for sure is you want, if you want to do this cost-benefit analysis, you need to look at the animals and the you need to have a study that takes long enough. Don't expect to, to change something in your biosecurity and see the effects one week or two weeks later. It really will, will take some time before you, you see the improvements. So you have to measure for six months, one year, and before you can see the effects. And then, and then secondly, really make sure that you have good, good quantification of your production results or your feed, mm -hmm. your, your growth production and, uh, and so on. And if you have all those uh, data well in place, uh, you really can see and you really can measure the effect. But it requires, it, the, the calculation as such is not so difficult. The difficulty lies in, 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 uh, in gathering all the required data. Understood. And uh, uh, yes, uh, I think uh, uh, gathering data is one of the uh, difficulties that uh, we can see into quantifying uh, what can be the cost and the benefit of biosecurity. However, uh, going into some other practical uh, questions that we got uh, in advance, uh, we would like to ask about the downtime period. Well, it can generate cost, but uh, how effective is uh, to have a longer downtime uh, period in uh, terms of biosecurity. So Manon, uh, please uh, get into this. Yeah, so um, yes, the downtime period is important. Uh, we have seen in the literature that the 14 days uh, downtime period was the recommendation, but it needs to be combined with removal of the organic materials, uh, higher pressure washing with a detergent, uh, disinfection, and as well as a drying period. It's very important to inactivate the pathogens. So by having the downtime period, uh, you would reduce the infectious pressure and um, make sure you're not contaminating the next batch coming into uh, the barn. So um, it, it is important, but it needs to be combined with the other previous steps to, to be uh, effective. Would you like to add something, Andrew? Yeah, well, I, I can fully uh, agree on this, that indeed the downtime period can help, but sometimes we see the mistake that people uh, use downtime period as, as an alternative to good cleaning and disinfection, and that you shouldn't do. 
because uh, if you if you have not done first a good cleaning and disinfection, even a downtown period of, of six months is not sufficient. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of organic material that, that remains there. The, the bacteria, the viruses, the parasites, they may hide in this organic mm -hmm. material. They can survive for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and then it, it doesn't matter if you wait uh, uh, one week or two weeks or, or even much longer. So the most important component is the good cleaning and disinfection mm -hmm. and then the drying off. And if you do all of this right, the downtime period afterwards is not so important, but, but having sufficient time between production rounds is important to allow sufficient time to do a true cleaning and disinfection. If you, if you shorten this time, every, everything has to be done under, under time pressure and the quality will go down. Yeah, and, and, and talking about disinfection, uh, Jeroen, we have some questions about that topic. I'm trying to combine all of them. We also have one right now in the question and answer uh, panel here. Um, so of course, the first one is which factor should be considered to choose disinfectant to use after cleaning a barn? And there's also some questions about antimicrobial resistance. If the use or the overuse of these disinfectants will cause any type of antimicrobial resistance over time. Okay, yes, two very interesting questions and questions that come back a lot. And, and this is the first thing about this, which disinfectant to choose. I, I want to go one step back. Always remember that cleaning and disinfection is it's cleaning and disinfection. Disinfection without cleaning is a waste of money. So the first step is to clean. And, and cleaning is, is cleaning with water, but it's also cleaning with the use of a detergent, with soap. And we often forget about the, the, the benefits of soap. It's, so, it's such a basic product that, that we forgot about how good it is actually. So a good, the first step, the biggest gain also, we've done some studies showing that the levels of bacteria are before you start and then after the cleaning, the biggest gain you, you reach is with the cleaning step. And if you've done that right, the next step is a disinfecting step. And a, a good disinfected product, there's plenty of good disinfected products. And my advice is use products coming from registered products so that have a, like a registering registration a protocol behind them. And often uh, the combination products are very good uh, where you have different active components combined in one product because they have a synergistic effect. Uh, so, but, but it's, I would say it's hard to find bad disinfectant products. Uh, so the majority of the disinfectant products are good, but you have to use them correctly, meaning at the right dose, uh, at the right concentration, and there often uh, many mistakes are made that you use them at uh, too low uh, concentrations, or that you apply them on wet surfaces. And when you apply a disinfectant on a wet surface, what you actually are doing is diluting your disinfectant again. And so, and then again, it's, it's not gonna work as you, as you want it to work. So that is what, with regard to the, the selection of the disin. If the disinfectant doesn't work, in, in my uh, experience, it's almost always related to a bad application and not so much to a bad disinfectant. Finally, with, re with regard to the resistance, uh, I've had two PhD students working on this, uh, doing a lot of research on resistance against disinfectant and the link with antimicrobial resistance. And uh, I, I, can, I can very simply sum summarize it in using, uh, uh, using disinfectants does not contribute to antimicrobial resistance and it does not contribute to an to resistance against the disinfectants. It can in the lab, and it might even have an impact in human medicine in very clean conditions in hospitals, but in a farming condition and uh, stables, uh, we, we have not seen it. And we have followed up stables for, for, for years actually, where we have repeated use of disinfectant and we could not see any increase of the levels of, of resistance in the bacteria. So once again, if your disinfectant is, is not working, it's likely not because there is resistance against the disinfectant, it's likely because it's not applied correctly. You haven't used the right concentration uh, and, and all those uh, potential mistakes I've mentioned. And maybe to add another example uh, to complete the answer is uh, the recommendations that we're no longer doing for food baths. 
So fruit bats would be very effective if people were washing, cleaning their boots before using it. But right now, the way people are using it is, is not beneficial. You're not gaining anything by using foot baths as people are not stepping in a foot bath long enough to have the disinfection process. And if you have organic materials on your boots while you're stepping into the foot bath, you need to change the disinfectant every time you're using it. So we're no longer recommending to, uh, to use foot bath on farms. Uh, we're trying to promote changing your boots and having dedicated farm boots uh, in, in, in replacement. And Marcel, if you allow me to add to that, because we just got another another question here in the. I was going uh, to add that exactly. That, yes. that goes with that. What about fumigation disinfectant products for the poultry house and the worker rooms and services sites? Is that also efficient? Or what's your opinion about these fumigation strategies that we have still in in a lot of, of farms worldwide? Want to go, Manon? Or yes, I can. I can jump in. So. Uh, Yes, it can be uh, an addition. Uh, if you're doing a good cleaning, disinfection and drying period, you might not need it. Um, so it is typically used in the, uh, in the poultry industry in Canada. Uh, there's not a lot of data showing the efficacy. I don't know if you have seen anything on your side, Jaren, but uh, if you're doing the right job right away, you might not need to fumigate at the end. Yeah, we, I, I, I would agree. We've looked at different applications of, of disinfectant, different, different application measures, and we don't see very big differences. If you, if, if whatever application, if you do it correctly, you'll get the good effects. But fumigation, if it is, if it is uh, um, selected from a practical point of view, it, it's, it's a good way of working. But, but again, it cannot replace the cleaning part. So it only comes after you've done a good cleaning. Yeah. And uh, to add the last part, probably, or maybe not into uh, this question, uh, what about the application of disinfectants into farm workers? Yeah, well, I would be very careful with that. Um, uh, again, um, what is important for farm workers and any visitors when they come into the farm I call it the three golden rules. They should change their footwear, they should change their clothes, and they should wash their hands. And if you've done all that, you have reduced the risks already enormously. You can add, if you want, you can add taking a shower and, and, and washing with soap, and then, and then it's even better. Uh, adding uh, something to cover your, your head if you, if you have long hair, which is not a problem for me, but for, for others it might be more a problem. But then, but then I think you've covered the risks. So adding things like you know, spraying humans with the disinfected products, I wouldn't do it. it, it it's likely dangerous. Uh, so I, wouldn't, I would not be happy myself if people would start to spray disinfectants upon me. Uh, and I don't think it's really needed. Again, don't forget the quality of soap. Washing with soap is really very, very efficient. Yeah, I fully agree with that. And I would add that uh, during the video surveillance we have done, we have seen that people were reusing the same clothing, their personal clothing on multiple days. And when you're visitors going on multiple farms, that not, that's not the best situation. If you're not changing your clothing while you're going on the farm, you should at least changing it overnight and wearing new clothing the next day. Really important, I think. So besides uh, these practices, uh, which uh, other technologies are available now uh, that uh, can help in the area of biosecurity, which are also, let's say, worth the investment? Yeah, there are a lot of uh, technologies that are now available for uh, producers um, in terms of biosecurity. So I'm gonna give you just a few examples as there are plenty. Um, you can have cell phone application. So uh, there's one that is that was developed in Canada called Be Seen, Be Safe, which is very uh, practical as it is a virtual fence around the farm. And with your uh, cell phone application, the producer is getting a notification while a person is crossing that fence around the farm. So you can have a virtual logbook real time and having notification that someone is getting on your barn. 
um, the, the application it also has a predictive uh, component in case of outbreaks. So you can trace back the visitors where they have been. So you can send notification to those farms that they should be increasing their biosecurity uh, measures because there's something going on in their area. So I think this is a very good one. Um, RFID tags are already being used in the swine industry, for example, for feed consumption with pigs. Uh, we're gonna be uh, exploring that option with boots and, and, and hand sanitizing. So we'll see uh, how this goes. Um, there was a new uh, technology that was used uh, in the swine industry as well, which is the sound detector. So you're placing those detectors into uh, your farm and you can identify health issues much more quickly than the farmer. So they, they have identified, for example, that you can detect health issues five days before the producers. So this is quite interesting as well to have um, a rapid intervention and to target those animals that are sick. And so you can treat only the, the animals that, that, that are sick. And finally, you have different robots that uh, you can see in the poultry industry as well, going around into the barn and, uh, and having those detection for humidity, temperature, uh, detecting dead birds. Uh, so you can, again, have the notification that there's a dead bird to pick up. Uh, and again, that would prevent future health issues. Great, uh, thanks, Manon. <clears throat> Let's. Uh, we do have two more uh, disease-specific questions, and of course, it's a big topic in the swine industry. I would I would like to start with that, uh, with you both. So, African swine fever is the biggest topic in the swine industry since a couple of years, and the question is, how can we avoid African swine fever outbreak? So, how can we avoid African swine fever to happen, and how much biosecurity is important? in this discussion? Yeah, well, um, I, I would say biosecurity is extremely important in, in the absence of a good vaccine or just any vaccine against African swine fever, biosecurity is actually the only uh, answer we, we currently have. Um, and, and, and if we talk about African swine fever, we're really talking about external biosecurity. It's about measures to, to avoid that the pathogen gets into your farm. So we're talking about controlling uh, visitors to your farm, controlling trucks to coming into your farm, but especially also controlling the animals coming into your farm. Uh, there is a saying that says uh, 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 many diseases are bought and paid for. If you buy in animals and you pay for these animals, but you also get uh, on top of that, you get some disease coming into your farm. And the most, the most efficient disease transmission route is the direct contact between live animals. So, so that is a part, uh, and to avoid that, yeah, you can either not buy animals, or if you buy animals, uh, be very careful with the source farm where you buy them from, and also be very careful uh, with, with your quarantine measures that you take yeah, to, to, to control uh, the health of the animals before they enter into your, uh, into your group. So, that's important, the animals coming in, uh, farm workers coming in, trucks coming in, and you have to be very, very careful about it. If you do all those things good and, and uh, continuously, as Manon has mentioned, uh, because you might do them, do them well at one point, uh, but you have to maintain this, uh, these measures. If you do that well, you can keep the virus out. Uh, that, and that's a good side of the story. It has been demonstrated in many countries where, where African swine fever is in the wild boar population, for instance, that if you maintain your good health, uh, your good um, biosecurity level, you can keep it out. One last thing I forgot about to say is the swill feeding, is the use of leftovers uh, to feed to the animals. And there you have to be careful with, because if they contain meat components, uh, 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 left over slaughter uh, uh, of home, for instance, if that if that if the virus can hide in this meat, uh, and then it can go back. Uh, so I have to be very careful. I preferably do not use these uh, kitchen leftovers. And if you use them, uh, they have to be heat treated. They should go to a true a, a, a certified process uh, where you can be sure that that any viruses are are uh, neutralized. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. The, the farm level biosecurity is highly important. I uh, would also add that uh, the regional perspective is also important. So being able to communicate the status 
of your farm in your region, um, being able to trace back where the feed truck went, um, the rendering truck. So really being able to have your region and to understand what's going on in your, in your region will be helpful in preventing the introduction onto your farm. Well, we have time uh, for just uh, one more question and uh, let me take uh, this uh, to the poultry industry. So you already gave a lot of advice uh, regarding African swine fever that can also be applied into the poultry industry. But uh, uh, what else would you advise uh, when we talk about um, um, the prevention and the, the introduction and the spread of uh, vertical transmitted diseases in poultry? Yeah, well, when we talk about vertical transmitted diseases, we have to think about the steps before the boarders arrive at the farm. So we have to think about the hatchery and we have to think about the breeder farms. Um, and because we, we, we very well known that, that diseases can be transmitted and from the breeders through the eggs, through the uh, uh, hatchery environment, uh, downward down to the, to the borders. So, so biosecurity is also important on, in those previous steps. So we have to have good health, good hygiene in the hatchery because that the hatching process is actually a dangerous process. So a lot of things can go wrong. A lot of bacteria can, can spread in the environment, can contaminate the other birds in the very early stage of their life when they are very susceptible. Uh, so so uh, the, the hygiene quality of the hatching has to be done well, right. Uh, these days, alternative system, systems such as uh, in-house hatching are becoming more and more popular. They have some, they have some big advantages also with regard to biosecurity. Uh, and then also what happens at the breeder farms. And we know that diseases, if the diseases are not controlled at the level of the breeder farm, they will be transmitted to, there is no way of, although we can disinfect, it, disinfect the outside of the egg, so we cannot disinfect the inside of the egg. And sometimes the pathogens are already inside. And just to add on that, I think hatcheries are, are also a nice place to sample to know the status of those breeding farms and to have the intervention, for example, with layer breeders, where you don't want to keep um, layer breeders positive for salmonella. So you, you would be depopulating uh, those flocks because you don't want to maintain that transmission chain into the egg production. Um, so hatcheries might be a critical step, but also it's a great opportunity to sample and to know the status of those breeding farms. Well, I would like uh, to thank you uh, for all the exchange um, uh, to uh, both speakers and uh, the panelists. Uh, there are questions that are still unanswered in the Q&A box. I apologize for not being able to deal with all of them during the session. However, we will be more than happy to pick up our conversation via email. If you write to our webinar at ewnutrition.com email, our questions will be written to us and also to the speakers. The recording of this webinar will be made available in our website in the next few days. Uh, thank you to our speakers for these insightful presentations and answers. Thanks to all of you for attending and also for your questions. Stay safe, keep the good work, and uh, bye for now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care.